judge anybody. We just want to pray, and, and, and if uh, things don't work out, God will find somebody. And it looks like God is getting ready to send us some, a revival. The, this people that were here, amen, they were very interested, uh, showed a lot of interest. If you have your Bibles, let's go to the book of Ephesians. And we're going, to, we're going to read chapter 2, verse 8, while you stand. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And I know this is Palm Sunday, and I did preach a little bit about Palm Sunday in Spanish. Uh, so we're not going to, most of you speak Spanish, you already heard that message tonight. It was a great day. But it was soon to come to a an end. Uh, but we're glad that uh, grace and mercy didn't stop when people stopped believing in it. When people stopped believing in Jesus and they crucified him, grace and mercy still continue to reach out. And it reaches to us here in Immokalee uh, 2,000 and some years later. And I'm glad for that. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Uh, chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And I would like to preach for the next five, ten minutes. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to be long, I don't think. But I do want to speak on this uh, misunderstood or just misguided Garbage that is preached as gospel. It is not gospel. We know what the gospel is. The, the Bible speaks the death, the burial, and the resurrection. That is the gospel. And so for us to accept the gospel, we've got to believe that there is a, a death that's got to be done, a burial, and there's got to be a resurrection. And we got taught in men's conference, and this is something we all should know, that there is justification at your birth when you give your life to the Lord and you're born again and then there is sanctification as you journey you, you, you God is going to help you to be sanctified and then after sanctification there comes glorification and we're not going to be glorified until the trumpet sounds but we are going to be glorified amen we are going to uh, get our reward someday and the devil is trying to discourage a lot of people. A lot of people are falling by the wayside because they don't feel the glorification yet. But praise the Lord, we're saved by faith. Amen. By grace through faith. Heavenly Father, we pray for this message today. And help us to preach the truth. Not to cover it up. Not to make it easy. Not to make it more difficult than it is. It is what it is. And we've got to obey your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Title of the message today is A Picture of Grace. A Picture of Grace. I've got a daughter, two daughters that are artists. They, they've, they've got a talent to not just uh, draw like stick figures. I'm talking about seriously. They, they are artists and, and they get money for their artwork. And so... That's how wonderful they are and how, how good they are at what they do. But if I were to ask either one of them, could you draw me a picture of grace? I, I, I've got friends. I was talking to uh, little Andy at men's conference in his big old huge camera. And I saw some of his work that he does. And, and I, he did it for Brother CJ and the, and the church in Lehigh. And it's a wonderful... A presentation very professionally made and and so I says wow I would like for you to do that for us too and then brother Angelo spoke up and he says uh Andy he says Ab about how much you charge for for doing a job like that he goes well he says for Immokalee I would probably just take a little bit more time make it a little bit longer than just a four or five second thing and he said 
I, I would charge you probably like a thousand five hundred. I about fell off the seat. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't show it in my face. I try to contain, and I'm like, well, I'm not worth a thousand five hundred. My picture would never sell for that. But if I were to say, ask Brother Andy, little Andy, could, could you take a, a, a take a photo of grace of the grace of God? He would. Well, what do I do? What do you mean? Take a picture of the grace of God? It, it would be like something that would. Cause us to wonder what his brother is. He lost his mind. How can I take a picture of grace? Can you take a picture of faith? Can you take a picture of the love of God? And I began to think, what would be a picture of the grace of God? Because a lot of preachers are preaching that that's all you need, just because the Bible says by faith, by grace, are you saved through faith? And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. And with that scripture, they preach salvation. This is how you get saved, by grace. But here in the scripture that we're reading, it is to the church of Ephesus. What does that mean, Brother Rios? That, that means that these people were already saved. They weren't looking for salvation. And Paul says, you're saved, but I want you to know it's by the grace of God that you're saved. And, 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 and I want you to, to, to know that you have to go through faith. And I, and I begin to think, how can I, uh, how can I take a picture of, of what, what Paul was trying to tell the Ephesians? You're saved, but don't go bragging about it. Don't go around telling it, oh, you know, I... I'm smart because I accept that Jesus is my Savior. These people went through the process. I would like for this tube right here to represent faith. I was going to write on their faith, but I ran out of time. So you can imagine, just imagine it that it says faith right there. And we could take a picture of this tube, right? This is Photogenic, I guess is the word. It is, it is picturable. You can see this. I don't know if you try to picture in your mind what grace looks like. I don't know what color it is. But if we could think of this tube as being faith. Because it says, through faith, right? right. So we don't want to take away from the scriptures and we don't want to add to the scriptures. Right. And then I got to thinking, what if there's somebody in the building that doesn't understand what I'm trying to say? And they're going to go home and say, that preacher said that you got to go through a PVC to get saved. I'm not saying you got to go through PVC, but you got to go through faith. So I'm trying to paint a picture of what actually literally happens. It's, it's a literal thing that you have to go through. And it is by the grace of God. That you're going to even come up on faith. That's right. And I remember I began to think. And I, and I began to think. Well maybe we can represent grace. With this little sponge. And don't ask me where I got my magic from. <laughs> I, I'm not a magician. I wish I could just put it here. And it would go through by itself. Um, but it just barely fits. So you don't want to put it sideways. So it definitely wouldn't fit. It would not fit like this. The Bible says straight is the gate, narrow is the way. So you got to come in the right way. First of all, you got to come in with an attitude of humility. People that says, ah, you're not going to baptize me. What? You're full of pride. You're, you're trying to come in your own way. You say, well, I, I, I'm not going to go to that altar. That, that's humiliating. Uh, and you, you can say whatever you want. But I, uh, I want to do what the Bible says. I want to be saved according to the word of God. And so we see for by grace, and I want us to focus on the word saved. Is that what we're all trying to be, is saved? So as we look at the word saved, this is what I want, Lord. Whatever it takes. And this is what people have to get to, to the place where they say, you know what? I've been to this church and I've been to that church and, I, and, and my mama was from this church and my grandma was from this church, but I, I, I want to be saved. 
And so you look at what they did and how they lived and what, and you say, well, I never did see any change in, in my daddy. When he started going to that church, he still continued in, in the same garbage that he was at. And so tonight we're not preaching a, a church building. We're not preaching a, a, a denomination. We are preaching, and we learned this at men's conference, we are preaching the kingdom. Do you want to be a part of the kingdom of God? If there is a kingdom, we learned that there is a king. And they taught us at men's conference that we ought to be concerned about what the king thinks. If it's his kingdom, then we got to take under consideration what does the king want? It's what I'm doing pleasing to the king. And he said what he desires and requires of us. And second of all, is what I'm doing, is what I'm doing advancing the kingdom or is it stopping the kingdom? And the, 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 the pastor there began to teach us how, you know, when he was a pastor, he had a lot of confrontation. A lot of people all the time wanted to counsel with a pastor, wanted to counsel with a pastor. And he said sometimes it would get so frustrating because It'd be years after they, they've already been going to church, nine, ten years, and they, they were still coming to the pastor for counseling. I, I'm troubled by this, pastor. I, I'm hooked on this, and I'm still trying to overcome. I'm, and, and he would think in his heart and his mind, really, you know, after all these years, you're still coming with this petty stuff. Can I please wear this? Can I? Is it okay if I cut this or if I wear this? And, and it's so, so petty stuff that the Holy Ghost should tell you right away when you get saved what the king requires, what the king desires. And, and it's not up to the pastor. A good pastor would tell you, you need to pray about this. You need to go to the king. You need to go to the, the, the he called this the, the constitution, this is the constitution of this kingdom is the word of God. Go to the constitution. What does the constitution to this kingdom teach? And do what you are told. But a lot of people want to take away from the constitution. They want to take away from what the king wants. Well, you can take it away all you want, but you'll never enter into the kingdom until you do what it is required to enter into the kingdom. And right here, it's not making a way. This is not the method to get into the kingdom. This is talking to people that have already done the method. They've already obeyed the king. They already obeyed the word. When Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and he said, repent, every one of you. Yes. Step number one. You've got to believe that he is. Step number two, you got to repent. You got to die out to self. The reason there is so many people quit the church and so many people backslide is because they never repent. What is repent, pastor? That means you, you, you're walking in this direction. You're going down this path of what you think is right. You're the boss. You're the God. You're in charge and you're going down this road to perdition. You don't even know, but you hear the word of the Lord. The word of God comes into your ears and you realize I'm lost. I am lost without Jesus. So you repent and you say, I'm no longer going to walk my life the way I think. I'm not going to walk the way I suppose. I'm not going even to walk like my grandma walked. I'm not going to walk like grandpa walked. I'm not going to walk like daddy walked. I'm going to walk according to what the king desires for me to do. And so you, it, that, that thing's got to take place in your life. You can, you can grow up in the church like Brother Rios did. I, I, was, I grew up in the church. But that is not going to save me. There came a point in my life where I, I literally just in my mind and in my heart. I'm not going my way. I'm going his way. And you, you literally do a round, a, a turn around. No longer are you going in that direction. But people want to continue in that direction of whatever they think is right. Pastor ain't going to tell me nothing. Bible ain't going to tell me nothing. I'm going to heaven just like the rest of them. How are you going to get there? What method? What airplane? What ship are you going to take there is a gospel ship that i invite you 
to take the gospel ship. It's the only ship that I know that is going to leave this world one of these days. And only the holy and the righteous are, are going to ride in this ship. And the way you get in is you got to repent. You got to quit going your way and start going the Bible way. And so, pastor, could you please tell me what is the way? So we've got grace, right? For by grace. Now, we cannot look at grace, although we cannot see grace. We cannot take a picture of grace, but uh, we can we can understand grace by the things that we see the grace of God do. There's a lot of things in this life, in this world, that you cannot see, but you believe in them because there is a, the Bible says that the wind bloweth where it listens. Nobody knows where it came from, but and nobody knows where it's going. But so is everyone that is full of the Holy Ghost. The world looks at us and they, they well, how, how do they do this? And where are they going? They can't tell because they've not been born again. But those of us that have been born again, we know where we're coming from. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. We know where we were and we know where we're going. But the world does not understand us. And so we, we look at, at grace. We're trying to analyze the word of God here. For by grace... Are you saved? And that's what we want. We want to be saved. But you got to go through faith. And the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please the king. I want to be pleasing, don't you? I don't want to stand before the king that day and he'd be like, sorry, I never knew you. I want, to, I want him to look at me and say, hey, Matt, Brother Rio's coming in. Don't you want to hear that? Yes. Don't you want to hear the king say, come on in. Yes. Come on, child. Get on in. Yes. I don't want to go through life. I I'm almost 70 years old. I don't, I don't want to get to the end of my life and not know that I'm pleasing the king. How do I know that I'm pleasing the king? Not up here. Not just in my gut feeling. But I've gone to his word. I've had preachers preach the word. And I say, wow, I believe what he's saying is in the Bible. Repent. I got to repent. I got to quit walking my own way and start walking his way. And so this is what we've got to go. We got to go through faith. Faith without works is. We, we don't even have a PVC. <laughs> if faith is without works. It is dead. It don't even exist. But praise the Lord that when you start finding the works of faith, and you, you begin to desire, Lord, I, I want to go through that faith. There is one Lord and one faith. Don't put in your mind, well, any old way, you, we're all going to heaven. No, there is one way. And Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say, I am a way, but he said, I am the way. And I want to go the way. I want to go the Jesus way. So we've got, we've got an understanding here. I hope everybody understands what I'm saying. You got to get on board of grace. What happens when you get on board of grace? It's when you repent and you say, I can't do this by myself, Lord. I can't do this. I need your mercy. Yeah. And I need your grace. I feel so sorry for people that are not preached the truth because they try and they try and they try and they, there's never a change. They come into church. The church is dead. There is no worship. There is no anointing. And they go home feeling empty because their preachers themselves are empty. The pastors of a lot of churches are false prophets. They're, pro they're preaching things that are not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible where anybody just accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and they were saved. There's no scriptures in the Bible that says that you shook the pastor's hand and you were in the church. You might be in the building. You might be in the congregation. You might belong to their club. But I'm telling you what, I don't want to just belong to the club. I want to belong to the kingdom. I want to belong to the king. And he's got a way to do this. And so we begin to see that we got to go through faith. And that not of myself. I don't create my own faith. Right. I had a, a man one time says, yeah, the Bible says 
Make up your own salvation with fear and trembling. We don't want to make up our own salvation, saints. The Bible says work out your own salvation. Faith without works is dead. So there is some work that has got to be done, but it's not grievous. It's not something that you got to go. You know, if the Lord would tell you, you got to paint your whole house purple and, and put a big yellow line around, I guess a lot of people would be doing that. But that would be kind of grievous, wouldn't it? Right. But God says, my ways are not grievous. Well, what does it take, Pastor? We'll, we'll take you into a tank, a water, or a river, or a lake, as long as there's water, and we will baptize you in Jesus' name. Why in Jesus' name? Because there is no other name given among men by the which we must. It's not a, 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 if you want to or not, or if the pastor or if mama did it or if grandpa did it. We're not here to judge grandma or grandpa. We're wanting to be saved. I've got to be saved. So we got to understand this scripture is not talking uh, to people that needed to be saved. These are people that are already a part of the Ephesians church, the, the church at Ephesus. And Paul said, you know, don't ever get proud. It wasn't that you were so smart that somehow you ended up at the right place at the right time. You know, when you were out there doing things that, that you weren't supposed to be doing. Grace. You couldn't see grace. But grace was trying to lift you up. Yeah. Look, bud, you're going down the wrong way. Why don't you run down that driveway and come knock on this door? Well, what is that? You cannot see, but it's the grace of God picking you up and putting you in a place where you're going to hear about the way that God wants you to be saved. God's way. There will be a preacher in that house. There will be a lady in that house that knows how to get to, how to get through the faith, how to, how to get from here to the other side. And we don't need false prophets. There are so many false prophets. And, 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 and I know we don't have a large congregation, but I was telling the church, I think it was Wednesday, aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't say where there is three or 4,000, I will be in the midst of them? He said, where there is two or three gathered in my name, I will be, oh, I feel the Lord in the house tonight. I feel the Lord here. Too. I'd rather have the Lord than a big crowd. My flesh, oh, my flesh. Oh, if I had a big congregation, Sister, and Uri Sister Rios and I, we'd go to Paris. We learn at men's conference the, the, the love languages. And, uh, it, it, you know, if I'm looking for a, a, a romantic wife that just loves me, thinks I'm adorable and, and all that kind of stuff, then I, I give her money or let her go shopping or give her what she wants or what she needs. And my wife would love to go to Paris. And Sister Rio said, if we had a, char a church that was so huge, they would just send us to Paris. They'd get rid of us. They'd go on. Get out of here, Pastor. We don't need you. We, we got plenty of other preachers, but we don't have that. But I'd rather have Jesus. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to have a large church. God is going to have a large church here in Immokalee. There is going to be revival in Immokalee. But I'm not looking for a vacation. I'm looking to please the king. And if I never, Sister Rios, if I never get you to Paris, if I never get you to, to see the Eiffel Tower or the Leaning Tower of Pisa or Hawaii or anything else, I, I want to I wanna do that for you. But if I never, I'll see you in glory someday. We'll be walking down the street of gold. And I hope I recognize you. I remember you, girl. You held on to your faith and you were saved because you went all the way through. There's an old song, I don't know if you remember, Sister Rios. I'm going through, I'm going through. I don't care what the rest of the world decides to do. I've made up my mind and I ain't turning around. Started out with Jesus and now I'm going through. Saints, this is a journey. And, and Paul here is telling the Ephesians, don't get proud, don't get arrogant. Always remember that you are dust. Always remember that you're not God. Always remember that didn't you, you didn't save your, yourself by your mind. If we were just to save ourselves by thinking that we're saved, we're saving ourselves by our own mind. All you got to do is believe. What do you believe with? With your mind? Oh, that To me, that's not good enough, saints of God. I'd rather go to the word of the Lord. And Paul is telling here the Ephesians, don't get 
proud and don't, don't get arrogant. It was by the grace of God that one day you came to hear about salvation. By grace, you are already saved. And that's because you went through faith. There's one Lord, one faith, I told you a while ago. There's not many faiths. You found out what it took. You, you overheard somebody say, I heard somebody say that Peter on the day of Pentecost, up there in that upper room, I remember the commotion. I remember what was going on. It looked like they were drunk up in there. And we began to feel something. We began to feel convicted of the things that we had done. We had crucified the Savior. And we asked Peter, Peter, what must I do? And Peter said, repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. And you shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. And you know what? I did I, I took the wings of grace and I went through faith and I came out on the other side speaking in a heavenly language I've been born again of the water and of the spirit and Jesus said unless you're born again of the water and of the spirit you cannot even enter into this kingdom so we must enter into the kingdom the way the Bible says and quit listening to false prophets that try to make this a method of salvation I want to go through it's not hard I've heard a lot of people say, it's, oh, it's so hard living for Jesus. I have never found it that difficult. Yeah, but if I go up there to get baptized, everybody's going to see my hair. It's going to get all wet. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> Would you rather burn in hell for eternity or let your hair down for a little bit? It's that repentant heart that says, Lord, I surrender all. I don't care what my hair does. When I begin to speak in a heavenly language, Lord, I don't, I don't care what people think. I'm just going to speak in a heavenly language. I'm going to let the Holy Ghost come into my heart. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5, it says, Even when we were dead in our sins, He has quickened us together with Christ. By grace, are you saved? Do you, know, do you understand what that grace means? We are, we are, Together with Christ. When did we get together with Christ? When we got the Holy Ghost. If you understand the oneness of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there's only one God. So when you receive the Holy Ghost, you receive Christ. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And, and you know what? If I'm going to go into eternity, Sister Rios, I don't know how long it'll be till I'm gone. And, and I don't know if you'll still be here or not. But I want you to know I've got Jesus inside of here. And when I, yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death and they bury in my hole, in a hole in the ground, I will fear no evil for thou art not just with me, you're in me, O Lord. And at the sounding of a trumpet that if Christ, if the same spirit that dwells in Christ dwell in you, the same is going to quicken your mortal body. But if you've been listening to false prophets that tell you you don't have to have the Holy Ghost, well, good luck with coming out of that grave. Because if the spirit that was in Christ is not in you, what's going to resurrect you? In twisting the word of God, there's this young lady, and I don't even know her name, but she's always on Facebook. Always. Is it a sin for Christians to gamble? Is it a sin for Christians to have casual relationships? And all these questions that she's asking the world. Probably asking people that are in false religions. And she posted the other day a drawing. Somebody just drew like stick figures. The, the doorposts of when Israel was coming out of Egypt. And the Lord told him to take the blood. And put it on the doorpost and on the lentil of the, of, the, of the door, of the entrance of the door. He says, everybody, the whole family, you get inside. And uh, the death angel is going to come. The Lord is, himself is going to come. And, and if there is no blood on the, on the post, um, the firstborn will die. And she puts that picture of the blood on the post. And she puts on the bottom, she goes... Aren't you glad that the Lord didn't look inside to see who was worthy or who was not worthy? In other words, saying, 
you Christians that you think you're worthy because you're covered by the blood, the Lord don't even care about that. Well, I got news for this girl that no one inside the doors of any house, of any church, of anywhere is worthy. But it's not our worthy or not worthiness that is going to save us. Because the people that were behind those doors on the day that the angel and the Lord went by, and the Bible says in the morning there was a, 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 a cry that went out through all of Egypt because people were waking up to their sons being dead. Not only the Egyptians, but their servants that didn't apply the blood. And it, and it seems like, like, well, God didn't look, so he was worthy. Then why did the Egyptians die? Because they didn't apply the blood. But inside of that room was a family that were listening. Uh, Moses, t t tell me again. Let me write this down. You want us to take a little lamb without any blemish. Okay, we, we don't want to get this wrong. Because, you know, this is, we got a son here. We want, we want him to, to survive this. Could you tell me one more time? Take a lamb that is spotless. And, and I want you to slay the lamb. And I want you to spend all night eating the lamb. Eat it all. And if it's too much, if your lamb is too much for, if there's only two of you in the family, invite your neighbors, come on in, let's share the lamb. All that had to be done if they wanted to survive. The blood that was on the doorpost was the product of what was inside. Saints of God, Jesus is going to cover you concerning, considering what's on the inside of your heart. Are you believing in Jesus Christ? Are you believing in the plan of God? Then the, the blood is going to cover you. But I, I told my wife today, I said, I wonder what would have happened if somebody just took an alligator, kill the alligator, get the blood, and put on the doorpost. We're not serving a blind God. A lot of people say, well, God looks in the inward. Oh, they want God to look on the inward. Then when they want to do filth on the outside, but now they're, they're looking at the blood. Oh, so God is only going to look at the outward. He's not going to look in the inward. But I'm telling you what, if God would have come across and there was a, a blood from a dog or a pig or an alligator, they would have lost the firstborn. Why? Because inside of the house, there had to be obedience to the words that Moses left them. You, this is what you got to do. And if you don't do it, your firstborn is going to die. Saints of God, my firstborn, which is my flesh, was born first. But praise the Lord for my second birth. Thank you, God, for grace. And before I close tonight, I would just like to paint a picture of grace. You got a little bit of time. And I know a lot of you have already heard this testimony. But I was born in the home of an alcoholic. A man that was out of his mind because of the war. He wasn't cruel to us, never beat my mom, but he was very cruel to himself. And every weekend he would take his paycheck and he would go out trying to erase the war and the things that he saw. And alcohol got a hold of him. And the only rest he could ever get is if he was drinking. And he would come Sunday morning and on the side of our house, we had a, an old couch and he would lay there because mom wouldn't let him in the house. He was so filthy, thrown up and all that. And he was laying on that couch. And there was a little trail that went by our house that led to a church, a Pentecostal church. It was at the end of the road. And the Pentecostal people would walk on the other side of the trail. They were so scared of this man. He had bushy, curly hair and big old beard and wouldn't hardly take care of himself and he was hung over sleeping and the Pentecostals were afraid and they walk on the other side and they'd go to church and worship. Finally, after so, so long a time of getting drunk and getting picked up by the law and going to jail, getting out, getting picked up and going to jail, finally the, the judge says, I'm going to have to give this man three years in prison 
or, or he's never going to survive. And so on the day of sentencing, my mom and I, I was only two years old. We went to court with my dad. And just a few months before that, there had been a, a black man by the name of Jesse. Jesse was always trying to witness to dad. Augie, he would say, look at you. You come in here all hungover. You're going, you're going to lose your job, man. You got, you got a family. You need to, why don't you go to church? Why don't you give your life to Jesus Christ? He'll change you. He'll make you over again. What was that? It's grace trying to come around. The grace of God going into the ears of this lost man. He wasn't saved. He wasn't changed. But the grace of God was reaching. Why, why don't you get on this, on, this, on this grace of God? Jesse would say, why don't you turn to God? And finally, my dad says, Jesse, I don't want to hear no more about the grace of God. I don't, please don't tell me no more about that. I, I have no use for that. And, and Jesse told dad, he said, Augie, he said, uh, I won't bother you no more. But just remember, if, the, if there is ever a time in your life where no one can help you, you don't have a lawyer, you don't have money, you don't have anybody to help you. He said, I want you to know that there is a God and he's real and he can help you. So dad sobered up in jail that night before his sentencing. He sobered up and he realized and he saw mom and I walking on the street down below. He was like the third floor up, and he could see mom and I, mom, skin and bones. Barely just had enough to buy it, to, to own a dress at the Goodwill or whatever. I didn't have any shoes on. My pants were all ripped. Nothing but skin and bones because there was nothing in the house to eat. There was always more liquor and more drinking. And so he saw that after he got sobered up, and he saw us walking up to go see him. So we saw him that day before the next day he would be sentenced to three years in prison. And the words, aren't you glad for grace? The words of Jesse began to echo in his mind and in his heart. If you're ever in a place where no one can help you, remember there is a God, and he's real, and he will help you. And so right there in the middle of that jail, he knelt down and began to talk to God. God, if you're real, tears began to fall down his face. And all the inmates there, like, hey, reals, man, only girls cry. He didn't care what they thought. He didn't care what they said. He was ready for some grace. God, can you please come and give me a little bit of grace? Grace came into that cell room that day picked my dad up and began to carry him. That grace took him before the judge in the morning. And my dad had asked God, God, if you're real, just give me one more chance. And I promise you, I'll never come to this place again. Saints of God, that is a picture of grace at work. This, this man had no, no right. He wasn't worthy. But God is not looking for somebody that is worthy. God is looking for somebody who said, God, I'm not worthy. But if you're for real, God, pick me up in your grace. See, that's what grace will do when you humble yourself. If you never humble yourself and you're always walking in pride, grace cannot help you. But he humbled himself that night and he cried for a long time that night. Just give me one more chance. And grace the next day walked with that and before the judge. Grace was standing right there. And the judge looked at mom and looked at me and looked at my dad and said, Augie, I've got enough here on record that I can sentence you for three years. And that's exactly what I wanted to do. But he said, I'm going to give you one more chance. What is that, saints of God? That's the grace of God. But we cannot stop at the grace of God. We got to find some faith and we got to go through faith. Praise the Lord that God brought us to that place, but I'm glad my dad and my mom didn't stop just at the grace of God. I'm glad they went through salvation one day in Kokomo, Indiana. Here we are. We've been, we thought when we were saved, we were baptized in the titles, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, out of money, 
tomato season was on, but we didn't have a house. We didn't have a call. Uh, we didn't have any money for food. We were running out of food that day. And my dad walked to the bakery to get some, some sweet bread, had a dollar fifty in his, in his pocket. He said, he walked down the knowing, trusting, having faith in the same God that delivered him out of prison. Now, probably like 16 years later, and we're out of money. And it looks like Brother Rios is boohooing, like, oh, poor, sorry us. No, I'm saying thank you, Lord, for grace and mercy that somehow you carried us to Colorado, Nebraska, Texas, Oklahoma, picking cotton, picking tomatoes, picking whatever there was there to pick. And it seemed like all the family in Texas were, you know, they were getting rich and they're buying houses and stuff. Here we are, migrant workers. My dad had an education, but God said, I got, I got some grace I want to give you that is more than just repent, more than just take you away from liquor. This is going to get you into the kingdom. There's going to be something that is going to get you into the kingdom. And I'm telling you what, my dad walked into that bakery that day, saw a church on the left. I'm painting you a picture tonight of the grace of God. This is what the grace of God will do. He'll bring you to repentance. He'll bring you to water baptism in Jesus' name. And he'll bring you to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And you can be born again of the water and of the Spirit. And I don't care what the false prophets tell you. Go to the Word of God. Go to the book of Acts, chapter 2, and first, verse 38. And, and I know what the false teacher said. Well, that was for the book of Acts. That's not for us. You better read it again. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to those that are far off, as many as the Lord are. You know what that almost says? Those are for the people in Immokalee, for those that are lost, for all the alcoholics, for all the drug addicts, for all the young boys that, that can't find their way through. Come on, come on, get into in, in grace. Grace is going to bring you through if I can find grace. What did I do with grace? Oh, Jesus, there you go. God is going to bring grace your way. And, and I don't know who this God, who God is talking to right now, but if you find yourself tired of church and tired of being offended when you go to church and, and you're tired of religion, you're tired of false prophets, I'm telling you what, you need more than just going to a building. You need to be born again of the water. Find you a pastor that will baptize you in Jesus' name. Not in the titles Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, but that, that Father is not a name. Holy Ghost is not a name. Son is not a name. But there is a name that has been given and is the name of Jesus. Everybody that was ever baptized in the Bible was always baptized in Jesus' name. Who was Peter talking to that day? All of the disciples. Repent, every one of you. And be baptized. You know who else was there? Mary, the mother of Jesus. Read it. She was there. What does Mary need to do? Mary needs to repent. And Mary needs to be baptized in Jesus' name. And Mary needs to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Who am I if the 12, if Jesus himself was baptized, who am I to stand behind a pulpit and say, well, you know, you don't need to be baptized. We learned something very phenomenal at the men's conference. That when you're an ambassador, an ambassador to another country, you are by law, not allowed to say what you think. You can't go as an ambassador of the United States to Africa and get together with the people, with all the other ambassadors, and say, well, you know, our constitution in America says this, but I think, you know what they would do? They would shut you up. We don't care what you think. You're not here to represent you. You're here to represent your country, your constitution, the government that sent you here. That You know what? We are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have a right to stand before you and say, well, I know the Bible says, but I think, uh, who cares what I think? What does the Bible says? Who cares what the false teacher said? You got to be born again of the water. You know who said you got to be born again of the water and of the spirit? That was Jesus. That was the main character in the Bible. That was the word that was made flesh and he dwelled among us. He said, Nicodemus, you got to be born again of the water and of the spirit. We got to go through, saints of God. As we get out there into the streets, God is going to use us. 
And the questions are going to come. Yeah, but the Bible says we're just saved by grace, not by works. Well, faith without works is dead. Are you glad you've been baptized? Yes. Aren't you glad you've been filled with the Holy Ghost? I, I, every day, every time that I hear this lesson, every time that I hear this message, I just want to say, oh, thank God I'm saved. <laughs> I'm glad that grace found my dad that day going to get that sweet bread and money would be gone. But he happened to see a church on the left here. Full gospel tabernacle. And he says, Lord, you know we're out of money. And I don't know what I'm going to do. But he said, if you give me a job for me and my family, and you give us a place to stay, I promise you, Lord, that tomorrow, Sunday, I will come and go into that church and see what you got for us. So that evening, that Saturday evening, a farmer drives up. I remember the farmer, big white guy, big tall white guy, walk, drives up in his pickup truck. And our fir the, the first truck on the left was our truck. Our, it was a, a 58 Chevrolet station wagon with a little trailer in the back. We had all, all our stuff in there. We were migrant workers. And he, he stopped and he walked straight to my dad. Didn't walk to any of the other people that were gathered at this uh, canning factory, a tomato can, Libby's canning factory in Kokomo, Indiana. And when we go there, Brother Angelo, I want to show him where, where God brought the truth to us. Mom and dad and us, we were all baptized in the titles, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. But God wanted to bring us through the real faith. And so my dad talked to the white man. He said, you need a job? He goes, yes, sir, we need a job. You need a place to stay? Yes, sir. We have no place to stay. He says, okay. So you need some money? And dad says, yeah, we're completely broke. We had come from Michigan picking cherries and had spent all our money to get to Indiana. So you need some money? Dad says, yes, sir, if I could get a, an advancement. And the guy was very impressed. My dad spoke very good English. My dad was an educated man. Just God had not allowed my dad to get a job. And, you know, you can cry for me and, and feel sorry for me, but I don't feel a bit sorry for me. Now that I look at the grace of God that was bringing the Rios family around, I, I, I would pick tomatoes again. I would pick cotton again just for the, for the grace that, we found, that found us. We were the ones that needed to go all the way through, not just repentance. We were, we were living in repentance, and we learned that yesterday at men's conference, and I know I keep bringing this up. But he, uh, Brother uh, Shock was preaching. He says, the day that my wife brought back that she tested positive for pregnancy, things began to change. Our money, our finances began to be going to a different thing now. We're going to have a baby. I'm going to be a dad. She started getting morning sickness. Things began to change when God begins when you when, when you repent and you decide to follow Christ things are going to change and a lot of people they 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 things begin to change and they think the pastor tells them well you're saved see things are changing right but you haven't been born again of the water the, their little girl wasn't here yet she hasn't been born but there are some changes will take place when you repent and a lot of people stop there and the real family were going somewhere but god was leading and guiding and and that day they took us to this little place and we got settled in that night they went we all went to bed and in the morning god like god shook my dad almost like woke him up dad woke up and the first thing that went through his mind was you know i promised god if he'd give us a place to stay and give us a job that I would go to that church and see what God has got for us. And so, mom said, if you promise, then we better keep the promise. They got up and they, they didn't have anything fancy to wear. We were migrant workers. They got dressed with whatever they had. And they walked into a church with white people. People that had jobs and had cars. And here's these two migrant workers walking in burnt from the sun and very ill-dressed. They didn't have style, clothes or anything, but those people loved them, hugged them and shook their hand, made them feel very welcome. The pastor begins to preach. 
the teacher lesson that morning, the Sunday school lesson, and mom and dad said they're listening, they love it because, you know, they love God and they love the word of God. And all of a sudden, the man says, you must be born again of the water and of the spirit. You must be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins. And when my mother heard that, my mother couldn't hardly speak English. But when she heard that, she elbowed my dad and she said, I've always wondered about that. Because the Bible says you must be born again of the water and of the spirit. And you must be baptized in Jesus' name. That's what the Bible says. And we're not baptized in Jesus' name. We're baptized in the titles. They're having this little conversation there. And, and dad says, well, I don't know. My dad was a, a pastor. He was, he was a pastor. He'd been a pastor. He'd been a, a preacher for a long time. He knew the Bible, read the Bible all the time. But he didn't understand why they baptized in the title the same way as the Catholic people do. And so they, he said, well, I'll, I'll ask the pastor when we get done here. So Brother Ball, Kokomo, Indiana, he's walking around shaking people's hands. He comes up to mom and dad, shakes their hands. So glad to have you. And, and dad says, well, we're, we're glad to be here. Uh, I feel like the Lord has led us to this place. He says, well, I'm almost sure <laughs> all things work together for good. And dad said, I got a question. If you got a minute. And Brother Ball says, sure. And he says, you mentioned baptism in Jesus' name. We've never been to a church that baptizes in Jesus' name. Everywhere we've gone, we've always heard baptism in the titles, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And Brother Ball looked at him, and he said, you guys speak Spanish, right? And my dad said, yes, we speak Spanish. My wife, she barely speaks a little bit of English. He said, I'll explain it to you in Spanish. And Brother Ball was a missionary to Cuba, and he began to explain to them the difference between Matthew 28, 19, go into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He said, I want you to realize and recognize that right there, he says, in the name, not in the titles. He said, go into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And took them to the book of Acts and showed them where Jesus came in the Father's name. So the Father's name is Jesus. Jesus had the name with him when he came he said i shall you shall receive the holy ghost who the father will send in my name so the name of the holy ghost is also jesus so when you baptize in jesus you're baptizing the name of the father the son and the holy ghost and dad said could you baptize us tonight what was that it's god's mercy dad could have went home and said oh that's a good bible study no you got you got to get him the wings of mercy and go through faith saints of god I'm glad that they said yes. I'm glad they said we'll be baptized. Later on, the whole Rios family was baptized in Wabash, Indiana. That's what you want a picture of grace. You want a pic I cannot photograph grace, but I can give you a picture. <laughs> Amen. I can see, I can, you can see what the Lord has done. I am the son of an alcoholic that has been born again of the water and of the spirit. And I'm not a she let's stand tonight. We've got to be, we've got to be thankful for our heritage and what God has brought us through. Sister Shaw, as you requested prayer for your family, it breaks my heart. I know what your mama would want. I know what your daddy would want, and we're going to pray. We gather here on Sunday mornings, and we'll gather again here tomorrow in the evening at 6.30, and we're going to pray, God, help help them. I feel attached. Your mom has preached here for us before, I, I, and you're here, and I feel like that's my family also. And we're going to pray for them that God will give them a mighty revival. It's closing time, saints of God. It's going home time. You're either going to get in now or you're going to be left behind. Jesus is coming soon. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. Thank you for grace and for mercy. And thank you for faith that is alive. Not dead faith. I must be born again of the water. And of the Spirit, I must be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of my sins. Neither is there salvation in any other. I'm glad for the day that mercy came. I'm glad for grace that lifted us up. I pray for this congregation today. Go with each and every one of us to our separate homes. And let us be witnesses, Lord. These are the last hours of the church. If we're ever going to witness, we got to do it now. 
And you're going to open doors for us to talk to people. You're already opening doors. Every time my wife goes to the groceries or whatever, there's somebody who wants to know. Carol, every time she goes, and I know that the rest of the saints here, they're talking to people. The, the harvest is getting ready. We're getting the trucks ready to harvest. Amen. Bless us all today. And as we go to our separate homes, bring us back at the appointed time. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Lord bless. Amen. Praise God.